and get, you know, they're perfect. Oh, do I need the mic? Yes, you do. Um, and there were just, like, way too many snacks, so I just put them out in the hallway and told everybody to eat, and hopefully they will. Hopefully. who will be talking to us about balancing community and corporate needs uh, between Moby, the Moby Project and Docker. So thank you for coming in here. Thanks, folks. So I'm talking about um, essentially the Docker project and the Moby Project, which came up as part of that. I'm curious how many people in the room have heard of Docker. Can you just raise your hands. How many people have heard of Moby? Oh, awesome. Almost, almost the same number. That's great. So what I'm going to be talking about is essentially what is Docker, for those who may not know, and then give you an overview of what the project and community growth has been like, just very briefly. And then try and describe the kind of different constituencies that you end up with once you have a project that grows that quickly and over, that, over the, the time scale that we've had. So Docker is a, a coming up this year. It'll be five years old. So that's not, lo not a long time, but also a really long time, depending on your perspective. And then I'll talk through the creation of the Moby project and the reasons behind that and the things we learn from that. And then I'm curious to know what kind of questions you might have, what discussion points there might be. So I'm, I'm talking to audience already know. So Docker is essentially container technology, and there's a commercial company behind the open source project. So it's open source software. It's built on the, the underlying things that are in Linux. And it's actually an ecosystem of tools, components, and services. So the Docker name covers actually a lot of different things. And the idea is it makes it easy for developers to build, ship, and run their applications. And it has been hugely successful. So this, so it's had tens and tens of thousands of stars and forks. And this is just the, the one main repository. There are actually 350 different repositories that people who work on Docker all contribute to. And each of those form different components, different services that all get pulled in to creating what the company produces as a final product. Now, stars and forks don't really indicate anything about deployment or how much usage there is of the software once it's out in the world. But one of the other things that Docker, the company, provides is a registry, which is called Docker Hub. So many of you may know that. And Docker Hub gives us an idea of how quickly the, the use of this software is spread. Because when you do a Docker pull, you actually pull from the registry, and we can tally up the number of pulls there are. And so over the last few years, we've crossed um, 11 billion pulls on Docker Hub. And this is an old slide. This is from 2017. So we're way beyond this now. And so it's, pr it's much, much higher. And with any project that's growing, there are always natural tensions. So I'm assuming a lot of the people in the room here contribute to open source projects and are involved with projects that grow. There are always tensions. It's not new. It's not unusual. And how you deal with those t tensions is one of the defining, pro defining ways of figuring out how healthy the project is going to be. But it's natural. And different groups and different types of needs form depending on how big your project gets. Now, for a project that's like Docker, when essentially it, the aim is it's go, we want it to be large, we want it to be used everywhere, we want to solve a big problem for how software is deployed, you end up with a couple of different large groups of constituencies. So on the left-hand side there will be the programmers, the people who first got started, the ones who downloaded stuff from Arivo, built stuff themselves, tried things out, saw the benefits, not necessarily deployed many things to production, but ultimately understood the value. They saw what was good and they enjoyed getting involved, and they formed the early part of the community. But on the other hand, when something grows, and there are people who actually want to use this and actually deploy it, large, large, large companies tend to get involved, because they have problems that want, they want to solve. The developers that work at those companies are saying, we have, there are solutions that could help with this. And so you end up with constituencies that span all the way from individual developers who are contributing code because they enjoy it, and it's fun, and they like the community. And on the other hand, businesses that just want to solve their problem. They have issues with deployment, managing software workloads, dealing with their traditional applications, and they see this as a potential way of fixing some of their issues. And at this size, when you get to a size like this, when you have that many deployments, that many pulls on registry, both of these are part of your community. All the way from the individual developer that's contributing code and just trying out your project for the first time, all the way through to the large enterprises that are trying to figure out how to take your stuff and deploy it internally and make it useful and then manage everything that's going on. And this isn't necessarily a new problem either. Think of the spread of Linux. So Linux is 
pretty much everywhere. And so that's used by people who are hobbyists, uh, people who are contributing, right the way through to large enterprises because they'll deploy this on their data centers and internal clouds. But those constituencies have very different needs. So the needs of the community are things around customizability, freedom. That's one of the reasons that people get involved in the project in the first place. They like the ability to see everything that's going on, take the pieces that they want, ignore the pieces that they don't want. But there's also the, also the desire for transparency, to see everything that's going on across the project, to understand what's happening. And one of the, issues that the, one of the things that the project has to deal with is provide that kind of transparency and ma uh, manage the stakeholders from all the different groups, all the different individuals that are involved, especially uh, uh, trying to figure out who are the good contributors who you should make maintainers, what kind of rights do the maintainers have, how does that cycle work. All those become important things. And then that also leads on to how the, uh, an open source project is actually governed in terms of how people are represented on there. And that works all the way through from small projects to also when the project gets much, much bigger and needs to be much more formalized. And there are also foundations that deal with these things. And of course, everyone wants there to be some level of support, whether that be uh, maintainers responding to issues on the issue tracker, or people looking at your pull request and contributing code, or people telling you how to actually get involved with the project, writing documentation, all of those things. The community project wants all of those, all of those things, and many other things besides, but I'm highlighting these for now. People who are interested in the commercial project, which is typically the larger enterprises, they have a different set of needs. So typically this is someone in an organization who may not be writing code themselves, but understands the, technical, the, the technology behind it. They're looking for something that's much more fully featured. They want something that, where the opinions are already baked into the software, so they don't necessarily want to be faced with a multitude of different options and have to think about the trade-offs themselves. They want to get the benefit of all the, all the work that's been done, but they want someone else to decide what the defaults should be, and there should be same defaults that they can then twiddle. They want, things, they want there to be an efficient development process as well. So this is a need of the company that's behind the open source project and the, the people who are essentially buying that product because the product needs to be able to respond to the market needs. So if enough customers say we need feature X and feature X is really important to us, the company behind the project needs to be able to figure out a way how to get that into the product to satisfy that need. And then there's also the issue of um, product and brand control because those companies are interested in, in essentially making sure they're getting the thing that they paid for from the people that they've, that they've been talking to. And so that means that the, the, the people building the product need to have enough autonomy, enough control over that to be able to make sure there's consistent messaging, that people understand that the, what the story is about a particular product and that that's consistent over time. And of course, larger enterprises, uh, the commercial product also needs to be supported. But in this case, that support may take a different form. There may not necessarily be an issue tracker involved. There may be, depending on the size of an organization that's interested in that open source project, there may need to be a technical account manager who actually gets hands-on and understands what the problems are and then can feed that information back into the development efforts. So going back to the previous slide, just a reminder that the projects like this have interest because they solve a particular problem. And that's why people all the way from an individual developer right the way through to a commercial enterprise are actually interested in it because it solves some kind of problem. But once you get into the weeds and you're involved in the, on, in the project itself, it can start to feel like you're competing against each other. It can feel a little bit more like this. So there are people throwing in what they were their views and opinions into how things should be built and then people on the other side. And it can start to feel like you're facing off against each other. This is largely unhelpful because you're still trying to fix the, the overall problem out there. So you need to bring skills from both those groups to actually be able to take all the ideas and opinions form and actually build something that is going to be useful, but without stepping on each other's toes, without getting in the way of each other's contributions while, so that everyone can get what they need. So this was, an issue, this was something that Docker, the company, needed to think about in terms of how things were going with Docker, the project. So. There was just Docker, the project, and Docker, the company. And so what, should, what um, a decision was essentially made that we should separate these two constituencies out so they both have the flexibility they need to solve, the same, to solve essentially the problems. So this became, on the left-hand side was something called the Moby project, which is the upstream set of open source work. 
and then the downstream uh, platform and product, which was called Docker. So upstream makes the container systems, so it's where all the open source work lives, it's where all the open source contributions and, and discussions happen, and then downstream is where all the opinions get baked in, and then a product gets shipped out to users, typically enterprise users. And there's also um, downstream products that are shipped that are free to end users as well. So this frees up the upstream to concentrate on the things that it cares about, which is having transparency over things that are going on, having the agency getting involved, understanding the governance. But it also allows the downstream to just move quickly and change things as they need to to solve whatever needs that they're facing. And so this was the decision that was made to make that, split, make that separation between the two sides of these kinds of projects. And this was... Um, Actually, this was the day before that was announced, so this was the meeting room where the rehearsals were happening for announcing the Moby project. So to draw an analogy, what the Moby project was like is we can draw an analogy with Linux. So it's a set of open source components. It's not a perfect analogy. a set of open source stuff, which essentially feeds into the Moby project, and then that, down, that is upstream of Docker. So the, a rough way of thinking about it is something like Fedora and Red Hat. So Fedora is where all the open source and innovative stuff can happen. And then Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the thing that Red Hat will sell to enterprises. So a slightly more detailed view of this is there's a whole bunch of open source components. So I mentioned that we have over 350 repos. And so way on the left there, you can see a, a number of those components. Those, are all, those all form part of the Moby project, which is an umbrella. And then there's tooling, and there's information and documentation about how to compose those things into producing essentially your own container platform, your own container system. And from this upstream, Docker produces its downstream products. So Docker CE, which is the community edition, and Docker Enterprise Edition are the downstream products built from the upstream open source components. So what happened when we did this? So at this point, we decided we were going to do this. This is how it's going to look. And then we, the, the company thought about it. All the open source maintainers were consulted. And then we went ahead with it. So this was just uh, a change to the README. So there were 122 comments made on this. And this, was, this was just, to just the, the, the PR to change the README to describe what was happening. And this is just one place where the discussion was taking place. There was discussion everywhere, on Twitter, on various other GitHub issues, in people's emails, on the forums, because a lot of people were touched by this change. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Some people didn't quite understand what was going on. And luckily, we did spend a lot of time briefing people, talking to uh, maintainers, talking to pe uh, influential people in the community to help them, help them understand what was going on. So the majority of people did get what we were trying to do. And one of the benefits of having a company behind an open source project is we can take that time to go out and with, with the cloud to go and brief people from the press people from industry, people who are writing about these things in, in uh, journal articles. So Docker also runs a captain's program. So there's lots of people involved in the captain's program who were, we were able to brief and make sure that they understood so that when they go out and give talks and e explain things to people, that they also understand the, what we were trying to do. So the fundamental question here is, did this actually work? So if we go back to this, the idea was essentially anyone could be able to take those open source components and be able to build their own container system. And it did work. So another uh, project came along, looked at the open source work, and was able to put together their own platform for their own needs, for their own customers, based on Moby. So this was Bellina, which, was, which is from Resin. And it's essentially taking those components and applying, applying it to their Internet of Things platform. So in a way, we can say that some of this was successful. But of course, a project this scale, these things take time to percolate through. There's lots more changes that still need to be made. But in principle, what we were aiming to achieve, we did, we did actually get to. And there's also a forum now where people can collaborate and communicate about things that are going on. And this is active and, and growing. And all of the original open source components still have all of their activity and are still growing. And something I didn't mention earlier is that those open source components, we also donate to other foundations. So there's not just one company involved anymore. There's multiple different organizations involved in trying to foster that open source community and ensure that it stays healthy. So overall, the kind of things that we learned from this is that 
you do need to over communicate and you can't do enough of this uh, things will happen on github issues you need to have blog posts people will give presentations update readmes everywhere it would also be a good idea to have things like faqs for the commonly asked questions and build that up over time and also try and provide a canonical place to point people at which actually has all the relevant information about what you're doing and also why you're doing it because the why is helping people understand why you're doing it is just as important as the thing you're actually trying to get across and so allow time for those discussions to take place at that time for that q and a especially with all of the major stakeholders in the projects and if you have a number of different repositories a number of different projects especially with the maintainers of all of those projects because they all need to be on board with any uh, um, wide reaching changes and no matter what you do it's not going to be enough you will either um, miss something or there will be um, a place that someone first lands where you didn't actually put the information and then they don't necessarily find their way easily to the canonical information it won't be enough and change is always difficult and especially changes that are really really large that take uh, quite a while to work through are going to be more complicated than most do try but understand that you won't necessarily get everything but this is a process where you can learn so you can always be learning when you're going through this process of, of uh, communicating with all your users especially when you've got a range a community that ranges right the way from individual users through to companies because once you've learned what that process looks like you can then start encoding it so that then uh, the next time you need to have uh, a large scale change you can you understand what that procedure should look like so a summary of this is that open source and commercial needs both both matter if you want there to be widespread usage of the software if you want lots of if you want lots of users uh, contributing lots of people involved in the actual repository as well as lots of people using the software so both the pure open source work and the commercial products that come out of that matter and those different constituencies will have different needs and sometimes trying to satisfy all those needs will involve some kind of structural changes to the way you actually work on the project so allowing people the space to get what they need without having to step on each other's toes without their necessarily having to be that kind of that kind of conflict and finally communication is difficult but it is really really important and you need to allow for that kind of communication in lots and lots of different places and if you're interested in finding out more about the Moby project you can go to mobyproject.org does anyone here have Moby project t-shirts okay I I can get you Moby project t-shirts if you would like come and talk to me if you do and I've gone through this fairly quickly so thanks for your time I'm also interested in what kind of questions or points you guys might have Yes. So the question to repeat the question just in case for anyone who's watching the stream is did we use the Moby name anywhere else internally it was that did I paraphrase that right? Yeah, and did that cause confusion? Do you mean internally or outside? Uh, so internal to the project I, I think there may be some components <coughs> that use the Moby name okay. and the fact that you reuse that name did that Okay. Cause so confusion? the question was um, did we use the Moby name internally anywhere else before the, the, yes we did. So has anyone used Docker for Mac? Okay, so Docker for Mac had uh, a minimal OS in there, and we named that OS Moby, and that was not, not meant to be released to the world at all. That was just internally, just for us, and we just happened to call it Moby. And then when we were casting around for a name for this project, for the open source project, the name Mo Moby bubbled to the surface. Now, Moby is actually the name of the, the mascot for the company. Moby Doc is the name of the mascot. So that's why it was just the internal OS which just happened to be called Moby. So there was some, a little bit of internal confusion, but I wouldn't say it was that particularly that great because that internal project was not really exposed to the outside world. So the confusion that the outside world may have seen was not because it was already had a previous name internally, if that makes sense. Yeah, Did I, that? I definitely saw that Moby name before the Moby project. So I, I, I definitely had something. You probably had a, a look in um, the, when you were running Docker for Mac, you probably had a look in at what was going on. Yes, yeah, that's where you would have seen it. Question here? Uh, 
Five of the talks <coughs> is balancing community and corporate needs, mm -hmm. which is uh, quite uh, opposite to each other most of the time. Uh, question is, what is the most challenging in your experience to balance here between those two communities? Okay, so to repeat the question, the title of the talk is Balancing Community and Corporate Needs. And what is the most difficult thing to balance? What has been the, the most challenging thing? Yes. What's been the most challenging thing to balance? Top of your mind. Top of my mind is the, the, the vast difference. Uh, firstly, co corporates want opinionated software. Open source contributors want flexibility and freedom. Those two things don't necessarily go together. That's one of the difficult things. Yeah. Because essentially the, the companies want something that's fully baked. They want a, a platform. They want something that is they essentially call turnkey. It works first time, it integrates with all their, the rest of their systems, it deals with all the horrible glue code, things work. Open source software is not necessarily built that way. And you don't necessarily want to bake in all the opinions of the open source software because that's not what the open source community necessarily wants. That's one of the hardest things to, okay. hardest things to deal with. Perspective to this issue, what are your personal key indicators to say, okay, we, we, we met this challenge, we succeeded in addressing this challenge? So, Personally, what do I think, so not speaking for Docker, personally what do I think is one of the ways that we could show that we've met that challenge is that given the way this, the separation happens is that someone uses Moby Project stuff to build their own container platform and the customers of the Docker product are happy with the product. That would be my personal criteria for did this work, which is what I essentially tried to get to. Because if someone uses that, the stuff that's from Moby, then that means that there was some value there that they could use. They didn't have to use all of the Docker stuff, they could take the Moby stuff and build what they needed from that. Okay. At the back. Can you say that again, please? Have you seen the growth in external contributors to the Moby project since it split out? Have we seen growth to the Moby project since it's been split out? From additional contributors that are not Docker employees. I don't have those stats to hand, and I wanted to run uh, wanted to run those stats before, but I, I didn't get around to it. So if I, can, if I get your details, then I'll try and do that and then get an answer to you later. Any other questions? Thank you, Amir. Thank you. Thanks. I'm not joking. I really didn't know that. Thank you, Laura. Why my work question? Okay, everybody. You're supposed to move into the middle. Oh, no, you're like, I have one chair. Exactly. Okay, move into the middle. And also, I'd like to encourage you, though not compel you, since it is late in the day, and if you're tired like us, maybe take a moment to stretch and move your body. Everybody and increase my blood flow. And if you would like, we can once again do the Macarena. Water, yes. 